All right, so uh, getting into swath grazing. Why swath grazing? Uh, it's a really, really great practice, I think, um, to both reduce inputs. Uh, our biggest uh, input with cattle operation is feed cost and winter feed cost specifically. So any number or any percentage or amounts, we can reduce that cost and go a big way to our bottom line, but also wonderful other benefits like uh, reduction in time, machinery, depreciation, fuel, and all the wonderful things that come with letting the cows actually uh, access the feed instead of taking it to them. So like I talked about, we start with this a lot. This is a graph by Darren Coleman. Uh, this is 100 years of uh, Statistics Canada data on farm profitability. So the blue line is farm productivity and the green line is net income. Now, a reminder, this is for all farms, not just cattle farms. And you're saying to yourself, well, my rich grain farming neighbor is on this list and so am I. Yes, uh, the cattle graph probably looks uh, even more devastating than this. Um, but with challenges come opportunity. And uh, I think it's a really great way to introduce some new practices to start lowering our costs and increasing our bottom line. So I talk about this a lot. I'm sure there's the same resources in Alberta and Saskatchewan, but this is the Manitoba cost of production budget. They do a really good job. And the biggest pushback farms have is, well, if it actually costs that much to raise cattle, you know, none of us would be making any money. Correct. <laughs> Uh, so I encourage everyone to do this, even if you're in Saskatchewan or Alberta, um, you can Google Manitoba cost of production budgets, all these numbers that are, they have referenced how they came up with them. But some of the highlights I want to pull out, uh, anticipated for 2022 winter forages, $426 machinery and equipment, $140 building repair and depreciation, 34 bucks, fuel maintenance repair, 51 uh, manure re removal, of course, at $11, and something none of us value, uh, which we should, because why the hell are we doing this, but valuing our time. So all of these uh, costs, uh, swath grazing can reduce substantially. And uh, yeah, it's, a, it's, it's the, the number one thing we can control is winter costs and machinery and depreciation. So taking a look at these costs, seeing how they work in our system and seeing if we can reduce those costs in our system, I think is a really natural step forward. So I'm just gonna talk quickly. Uh, I, fortunately, we have a wonderful panelist group tonight and they ha actually have more experience than me. I'm going to be quite humble in my experience that uh, it hasn't particularly gone well, but I think it's more management issues than anything. Uh, but we did stumble on uh, kind of a neat finding a few years ago, um, and it turns out the panelists that are on have been doing this for a while, but using warm season uh, cereals or warm season blends uh, in a swath grazing scenario, well, why? Well, warm season plants have evolved a waxy leaf. This uh, helps reduce evapotranspiration off the leaf, reflect that sunlight so the plant can actually hold more moisture. I mean, one thing that, that works really great in a swath grazing scenario is, I mean, in a swath that uh, moisture now sheds off that waxy leaf and you keep quality in the swath for longer. So we've had uh, quite a bit of success with it and um, unbeknownst to us, all of our panelists have actually uh, also use warm season grasses, so we're going to get into it and we can obviously talk lots about different blends or different uh, plants for swath grazing, but this is something that's worked really well in our operation. Uh, this was the first day of our first swath grazing, so it was exciting out taking videos. You can see we cut it with a 12 foot disc vine, which we're going to come back to that that was a huge mistake on years that we get a lot of snow. But the cows did an excellent job uh, cleaning it up. This was the last day of the uh, swath grazing. And you can see we had kind of tough conditions, very icy. It was getting above zero. So the snow was kind of turning hard and they probably didn't do as good a job cleaning it up as they otherwise would have, either with a bigger swath or different weather conditions. But I was pretty happy with the job. And this is the biggest benefit. We can just reduce our feed input costs so much um, by capturing photosynthetic energy and leaving that plant material right there. Um, so on this 17 acre field, we figured a cost savings versus a uh, commercial crop, a uh, high input crop at like $3,700. Uh, um, but not to bury the lead, uh, the, the guys also have some numbers as far as um, cost per day and grazing days. 
So without further ado, uh, Owen, if you want to take your uh, uh, mute off and turn your video on, um, so, uh, Owen Taylor from Mather, Manitoba. So, oh, why don't you talk a little bit about your beautiful family, uh, where you farm, and just give us a kind of a brief rundown of, of your farm. Yeah, I farm at Mather, Manitoba with my wife and four girls here. Uh, feel free to insert your own four daughters joke. I've heard them all at this point. Um, we have 220 cows. We've been up to 260. Uh, and we um, don't do any cash cropping. We have several pastures in perennial like tame perennial and then some native perennials and then the rest uh, we sow cover crops and either make feed silage uh, sometimes graze during the growing season. Whoop. Sorry oh as you know I'm not the technical guy there we are um, yeah oh what we wanted you to talk about here is just like not necessarily just your swath grazing journey but like how you got to swath grazing and kind of the experience you've had uh, in the last few years doing it. Um, well, I got to swath grazing. I I'd thought about it often, but I uh, I don't know whether, you know, years ago, my dad tried and had a bad experience or he just knew a neighbor that had tried with barley or oats and it just didn't go well. So that's kind of what I grew up with, that there just wasn't, it just wasn't, you know, a, an option for us in our climate. Um, and then I learned talking to Joe lots more and some other producers about warm season plants and Joe kind of touched on that. So when I, when I learned more about warm season plants and, uh, Joe developed a really good blend I thought would work well. I uh, I gave it a try. And I, the reason I wanted to try swath grazing is we've been bale grazing for years and having really good success with it. But I always kind of thought I I was starting to bale graze as soon as my, you know, any fall grazing on regrowth was done. And it sounds kind of silly, but I, I kind of thought I was feeding bales when it was too nice a thing to do. Uh, lots of years, end of October, early November, um, it just seemed like I, I was missing a step and that that's what led me to try swath grazing for the first time to kind of fill that gap where I'm not having to feed prepared feed as soon. So a good segue. -o. I think this is the first shot you've had at uh, swath grazing. Wow. What a crop. Yeah. And uh, you wouldn't believe it, but Covers and Co. took people on a field day to that to that day, to that field. Remember, Joe? Those guys are idiots. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Why would you ever look at this field? um so this was uh, with the crop insurance adjuster yeah yeah uh so this was a 20 acre there was an old hay field this was in the in the 2021 drought uh it was going to give us just nothing for feed we knew that so i thought well i'll just take a chance i threw in a bunch of warm season species and then i uh i prayed for rain and um i did get enough rain to get it germinated and, and everything came up pretty good um, but then grasshoppers took everything basically, but the sorghum, I did have oats and peas in there, which are cool season species, but I had oats and peas in there. Uh, they weathered away in the heat and that photo there, that sorghum, it just kind of stayed at that stage for, I mean, I don't know, it was four or five weeks. And every time I drove by, and I'm sure every time anybody else drove by, it's right on the highway, they thought that sorghum was going to die, but we got rain. We got an inch and a half in one shot. And uh, that is what it turned into. Uh, so I kind of lost my diversity because of the weather, but I had warm season species in place. Um, uh, the sorghum, I mean, the millet kind of didn't do great either, but the sorghum just hung on and hung on and hung on until it finally got moisture. And like Joe said, the C4 grasses are so efficient with moisture and it just exploded. And uh, I was turned out, I had something in a year where there was, there was basically nothing anywhere. So we're going to come back and touch on actually this exact crop, uh, a kind of feed quality and digestibility. But this was around the time you guys cut it. Yeah, it would have been it would have been right around here. The the sorghum wasn't uh, had, had just started to head, so that's when I cut it. So uh, maybe just talk about uh, how the cows cleaned it up and what you saw. I mean, we've got uh, kind of your your grazing days down here, but just talk about how your first experience was. It was really good. That year we had 230 pair. Um, like I said, I cut it right right when the sorghum was just starting to head out. Uh, I bore a neighbor's 25 foot swather um, and it, there was a big swath. That was about as much snow as we got um, before they were done it. So I had, had no issues with snow at all. Um, and I was just really, really pleased with how they cleaned it up. And these are cows that had never had never swath grazed in their lifetime. So they, uh, it, they didn't seem to take them any time at all. To, I mean, and it shouldn't. They could see the swaths. They didn't have to dig for them. But they had zero trouble adapting to it and, and, and just carrying on with their lives. 
So I know Rob's going to talk a little bit about this too, oh, but um, this was your year two of attempting swath grazing. So of course those cows are not swath grazing, um, but maybe talk about kind of what you were, the goal was with uh, this crop here and then um, kind of what the plan was. Yeah, so I sowed, uh, it was a blend of a few uh, winter annuals or winter biennials, uh, sort of a little bit of winter wheat, some rye, some triticale, but th the point was I sowed it in the fall. I actually, it was a, it was a dry fall. I was able to graze, get a few grazing days in the fall. And then this picture's from the spring uh, around June 1st. I kicked a bunch of the cows out or all the cows out, I guess. And I don't remember my exact days. I let them graze, but they were out there for, for several days anyway, and then let it regrow a little bit. And I sprayed it out and I sowed a warm season blend into it. And that looks like a hell of a crop. Yeah, this was super, but this is a, this is one of those lessons I learned. So I just mentioned how the first year I borrowed the neighbor swather and uh, went and cut that sorghum before it was headed. And that was just, I don't remember exactly why I picked that time. I didn't have a, there really wasn't a reason. Now this crop almost got away on me. It was huge. It was wonderful. Lots of diversity. Everything was great. But uh, the sorghum started to head um, and I just let it keep growing. It was just I mean, it was just great. There was just so much growth there. It was fun to walk by or drive by in the side by side. Uh, but then I, I realized that there was no way I was going to be able to get a swather to cut it. Um, it was just way too high. So I had to use my disc spine um, and letting that sorghum all head out. Uh, the stalks got pretty thick on me. Not not maybe not the thickness of a corn stalk or the density, but but far less palatable than if I had to cut it earlier. And I think if I had to cut it earlier, I could have used a swather. There wouldn't have been, it wouldn't have been uh, so tall, obviously. So right. I uh, I kicked out 220 pair. Um, they still had the calves on them, and there was I think 40 bred heifers. So I used uh, about 300 animal units to figure out my swath grazing days. 14 days on 40 acres, uh, about 105 days, but but more waste than I would like. Not so much. I won't be able to sow through it next year. I'm going to sow a full season cover crop there, but definitely didn't utilize uh, didn't utilize it as quite as well as they could. But, so um, I know this is a video hero. You got still got calves on the. Uh, oh, that's a Holstein there. Are you in Holsteins? Uh, sometimes um, I am. Yep, <laughs> I have this dairy <laughs> farmer uh, dream of mine. So once every year I buy a couple to nurse calves. Yeah, <laughs> and I'll say the same thing I always tell you. You truly are an idiot. <laughs> anyway, <laughs> let's get back to, so talk about the condition of the calves, condition of the cows, how'd they do? Uh, cows stayed in really great condition. This was, uh, I cut this field in half, so they had about 20 acres. Um, like I said, they were, they were a little mature, so they didn't clean it up quite as well as I would have liked. Um, and then that 105 days, so after that 14 days, I uh, we started taking about half the ration. So I don't know how many bales it was. It was about half of their overall needs. Uh, in bales and then let them clean it up. Um, I think as I continue to do this, I'm going to get more comfortable on how much to make them clean it up. But I'm, you know, it's only been, you know, three years or whatever it's been. I'm, I'm learning slowly but surely on, uh, on how hard to be on them. But as far as condition, the cows and calves were in excellent condition, really good. And I was really pleased that uh, with six or seven or eight species in there, I wondered if the cows would be really selective when they put, you know, their face down in the swath. But they didn't seem to be from my observations. They just took a mouthful and carried on. Um, so I was I was very pleased. And like I said, more more left there than I'd like. Um, but uh, yeah, but uh, not not so much that I'm going to have an issue dealing with any residue in the spring. Well, that's so kind of here's the side by side of your year one and, and year two. And then uh, I don't know if the picture on the right is accurate as far as what, what was left behind, but uh, without giving away too much, because we're going to talk about residue management the following year. Um, I guess, what did you see? Like, I know on the left, you seeded directly into that with a disc mm -hmm. drill, but on the right, like kind of what did you see as far as residue and you got any plan for it come spring? Yeah, well, that, that picture is not, they were, they grazed that a lot, a lot more. Um, so that, that's not a totally accurate as far as how much uh, material is going to be left. But no, I don't, I think, I think I'll be able to sew right through it. We have a 750 uh, uh, zero till John Deere drill. Um, I think, I don't think we'll have any issues. Uh, there was just more, those stalks on the left there, the stalks that are left this year are bigger. 
They're just yeah. bigger around and coarser, and there's just a bit more of them. Like you maybe you can see a lot of a lot of the ground there on the left. Like I said, the picture on the right is not totally accurate to what we left, but you can't see as near as much bare ground and just bigger bigger stocks what's left this year. Cool. Well, we went drastically over time, which as we always do, so that's cool. <laughs> uh anyway great job oh i think that's all i got from you yeah you betcha so kyle if you want to uh unmute yourself and turn your video on um so we're very fortunate to have uh kyle hebert here from the saskatchewan so i think kyle is the resident uh veteran of swath grazing on the uh panel today um so it's uh great to have him on and take take time out. Um, he can offer a lot of value to the, to the people on today. So Kyle, introduce yourself, talk about your family and uh, yeah, we'll get into her. Uh, Kyle Hebert from down at Water, Saskatchewan. This is my family here, my wife and two boys, Hunter and Cruz. Um, we started swath grazing about 10 years ago. I was raised on a family farm of uh, cows were to be fed from November 1st to June 1st. And that's just the way it was. You probably carried him a couple of pails of chop every day and you calved inside the barn. Um, we started swath grazing, simple for fact of our cow numbers grew, um, trying to keep our equipment costs low. So we had a, we had a mixer wagon that was probably sized for a 200 cow operation. And we had 600 cows. We we're doing 12 to 15 loads a day and a couple of kids in the tractor. So we thought, why chop it and haul it in to haul it back? So we tried uh, tried mill it on year one, um, went extremely well. We we had a lot of learning experiences though. I would I can't say that for sure, but um, types of wire to use, types of fencing to use, how many days to give them, all those types of things. So um, we've kind of just kept with the golden German millet. We did try a barley oats mix one year. Um, the only downfall to that is that cows are a little more selective on what they're eating and they, it was a little easier for them to eat the grain off of the straw. So then they would, you know, at the end of the rotation, they were a little grumpier just because of what there was left for residue. So, um, definitely happy with the millet and in our system, we, uh, we rotated around on different quarters, fairly close to the yard. So we have access to uh, water. And um, we fence them to four to five day paddocks. And we found that anything over five days, the waste goes up substantially just in, we, we don't provide the cows with a place for bedding. So they lay in the swaths. And if we give them any more than five days, then they, uh, they shit in the swaths and they don't eat it. So if we stick to the four to five days and then we can kind of plan around weather a little bit too. And nowadays we plan around kids hockey a fair bit. So we, uh, the four to five days has come to just, that's what we do. We try and do a lot of fencing in the fall before winter gets here, but uh, there, obviously there's still lots of fencing to do throughout the winter. Kyle, Mike, I, think, I, I think that's a good, I, it's not a question we've had, but a very real, uh, what can be an issue with swath grazing. Maybe just take a minute and talk about, I guess where you started, what fence you were using, and like where you're at now, and what you did. Yeah. So when we first started, we used poly wire because that was the stuff that was at the co-op, and it looked like it was easy, simple to work with. And uh, I'd, I'd like to find the person that invented it. <laughs> so I visit with them for a little while, and we've moved to um, aircraft cable, and we use a reel that's built by Seven L. There's a company that makes them. So the, the reels can be operated with a cordless drill and the aircraft cable, we, we just love it. Um, it's strong. So if, if deer go through the fence at night, they don't break the cable, they might knock it out of an insulator, but, and it carries current extremely well. We've had the original reels we've had now for eight, nine years, and they've probably been rolled up and rolled out couple hundred times each and the cable still looks like the day that we got it they're strong and they carry current extremely well so when we first start grazing a quarter we'll have up to you know three four miles of cross fences set up on that quarter section and we're we're still able to have the same amount of uh current going through those wires as far away from the yard as we get so 
And sometimes we're operating on 12 volt fencers. If we can operate on 110, of course we do. Uh, this winter we've been operating on uh, on battery operated, which is fine. We we did also we switched over to speed rate fencers a couple of years ago, just so we had the option to um, use one that we can shut off with a remote, and that was something too. That when we first started, we we're using uh, just jumper cables to get from the main fence to the cross fences, and when cows are bored in the winter time and they have lots to eat, they will go lick at your jumper wires and they will knock them off and then somebody will go try and see if the millet on the other side of the fence stays better so we went to a remote operated and it it has helped a lot so we can turn it off and on and use uh use good clamps to set it in and this picture here is is of this winter um we probably have more snow than this picture now our cows have been doing it for up to 10 years. Um, and we do sort our cows before we start swath grazing. It's just a decision and preference of my own. Um, we sort all of our young cows off and any cows that are older and starting to show their age, we sort them off. So out of our main cow herd of 800 cows, we'll have 500 to 550 swath grazing. And then we will, uh, We'll feed the younger and thinner group of cows every day. And the, and our main reason for doing that is because these cows in this picture are going to swath graze right from the 10th of December. And they probably have about 20 days left of swath grazing. So they're going to get right to the 1st of March swath grazing. And if I don't sort them before, I find we have to pull those older cows off in January, February when it gets cold. And... We have the right group of cows out there. They do well and they flourish on it. Typically, you know, at preg check time, our cows are in a, in a three to three and a half body condition score. And then they go grazing crop residue for another 45 days to get them to the 10th of December. And then, you know, so we, we hope that they go into swath grazing at about a three, three and a half. And I would say right now our cows are at a four. They picked up a half a body condition score swath grazing so which I, i'm super happy with this year it's uh we had a tough december but the cows kept their condition score and in january here they've put put a lot of weight on so it's worked out really well Kyle, uh, you, you touched on a point that i think is important well at least i assume it would be important what if what would happen if you went and bought 100 cows from a traditional operation that is you know bunk fed and kicked them out on that swath grazing. What do you think would happen? Um, well, we actually, uh, we've done that in the past and it it works fine as long as somebody shows them how to do it. So if they went out by themselves, they would struggle. And in our group of cows, with if me and my wife go move the cows out of 500 cows, 60 of them go open swaths and the other 440 are followers. So those new ones are gonna be followers, but those 60 cows that open the swaths for everybody and show them where it is. Like right now, they actually put their ears under the snow to find those swaths. So if those 60 are there, they struggle. They walk around and complain where yeah. those 60 lead cows go open the swaths and it's not an issue. But like make you sure, said, make sure you're taking, take, taking their ear tag numbers. Yes. Keeping the replacements. Because <laughs> every year we will have up to 100 new ones swath graze right so we dump about 150 new bred heifers a year into our program so after they've had their second calf then they start into the swath grazing program so there's up to 150 that have never done it before so i'm just i'm just gonna switch the the photo kyle but i i uh i got a follow-up for you like we've obviously had years where there's been a shit ton of snow i mean maybe touch on how many days in the worst case you've lost and what you're seeing as far as le residue left behind on those years where we get, you know, I mean, there's a lot of snow out there. That's, I mean, that's pretty impressive what they've done. Um, but you know, in a year where we're getting another foot on top of that. Uh, yeah. So in, I mean, we swath grazed here last winter and we had, we had an unbelievable amount of snow last year, probably had close to three, three and a half feet in the trees. Um, 
we always get wind down in our country, so the wind will usually clean off the tops of the swaths a little bit. And the key thing here is, I don't know if you can notice in that picture, that's a big swather made that swath. And we use a 40 foot swather. And as far as I'm concerned, the bigger the swather, the better. Because if that swath is two feet tall, they'll find it. And we've had years that were bad enough that the cows struggled a little bit. So I would just run out with the, the tractor to bale and flip them over and show them where they are. And last winter, we had to do that a couple of times. And uh, the cows actually follow a swath for a half mile as long as they find it. So last year we had them actually grazing and there'd be spots out there when we are moving the wire the next time with the kids on their skidoos. And like, I mean, there's a three foot drop from the snow to where the swath was. Yeah. And like this, this picture here was taken probably 10 days ago. So that cow's been swath grazing since the 10th of December. Um, she's in really good shape and we had a tough December. So, and there's our, that stubble is probably six to eight inches tall and it was completely covered before we had some warm weather to make it poke through. So, so you know, I, keep going photos. I, I'm just wondering, uh, I mean, I, I'm a user of German millet as well, and I can attest to what you said. I've I, I've now been burnt twice in a row, which proves I'm just not that smart. Uh, cutting German millet, uh, otherwise heavy crop with a disc bind, and then trying to graze it, a 12 foot disc bind, and we get a foot of snow, and they're just they're just not doing it. They don't they can't see the swath there. It just looks like a a, a fucking flat snow field. And they just look at you and ball and ball and ball. It doesn't matter how much I try and convince them. So I, I agree 100%. I think everyone that's on except me cuts with a swather. And I'm the only one that's that's been burnt by this. But what I wanted to talk about with the German millet, um, again, my most favorite millet, and I assume you're doing it to uh, control. I mean, it's a gorgeous plant. It grows beefy. But uh, I mean, yeah, I'm assuming you're doing it for the lack of volunteers. And then just talk about when you, uh, like we've done lots of German milk for hay, just, and sometimes it can get pretty rank, but when are you trying to time that to, to kind of maximize feed quality or digestibility? Um, so in the first five or six years that I played with it a little bit on timing, um, now I would just about close my eyes, seat it on the 1st of June and swath it on the 16th of the September. Um, Yes, there's going to be a five day variation on swathing time, just depends on summer and um, how the crop comes out of the ground at the start of the year. But as a rule, that's what we've done over the last six, seven, eight years. And this year we swathed on the 17th of September, by far the biggest crop we've ever grown. I've, I've never ever had an issue swathing millet before because it usually stands very well. And we've grown some big crops of millet this year. It, it was terrible swath. It was down and lodged and wet. We fought through it, but I still would use the 40 foot swather, even if it was hard to swath, just to leave them a big swath. And really, it doesn't matter how much of a mess you make swathing it, the cows are going to get it anyway. So we left lumps and piles everywhere, but just gave the cows something to find. And our Maybe. swath, like our millet this year, I should have taken pictures when we were swathing it. It was four feet tall so it, it was hard to swath but I mean still this is the end result with a big swath easy to find yeah and if you keep going in your slides I think there's one showing how well they clean it up so that picture was taken about three mornings ago we moved the cows that day and that swath looked just like that one in the last picture um so one thing that I've had to get used to in the last eight or nine years is when you go out there and there's still a little bit of straw left and it's minus three turn around put their mineral out and go back to the house because they can clean it up and they still tomorrow they're going to get get to eat twice as much as they should and they're fine mm -hmm. and it's been a hard mindset change for us and because i uh we still want our cows to be in three and a half to four body condition score and we keep them there but, and it's also weather related. I mean, obviously this picture here, if it would have been 40 below, I probably would have felt sorry for them moving the day before, but mm -hmm. if weather allows it, we will, we will make them make it look like this. And then 
the first 90 acres that we did, um, we ended up with some residue left just because of weather. So we fed them about a half rate of silage down there for five or six days to make them shine it up before we move them back to the next uh, field of millet. Um, again, just to get rid of residue, I'm not a big fan of running harrows a couple, three times in the spring to clean stuff up. We'll make the cows do it. And we never ever have had to take the cows back in the spring to clean up. We do take them back usually just the way things work while we're calving, but there's usually nothing to clean up. So it's easier in the winter because they don't push it into the ground. They don't make a mess. And as long as you fence them to four to five days, these pictures are very, very easily to accomplish. Um, once the cows respect the fence, they, they just wait for you. And even this morning when we went out, they're not quite ready to move. Um, the cows are all spread out grazing. If they don't come to the truck, I don't move them. So it, it doesn't look like there's enough there for the day, but they are content doing what they're doing. So we left them and we'll go back tomorrow morning and move them. So they'll be set up for their next paddock and it should get us through the hockey games. So that's a, you, you raised a good question. That's definitely going to be asked. Do you just know how big the paddocks are and know how many cows are there and know how much feed is there? Or are you watching their shit? Are you, are they chasing the truck? How do you like, how do you make that decision when they move to the next paddock? Um, for the most part, it has to look like that before I move them. Unless it's 50 below, I probably moved them the day before. The be like the one thing that I've learned too is when we first started swath grazing, we had a base herd of probably 500 cows. So we were swath grazing with 300. The more competition there up there is, the better a job they do. And we swath graze some pretty nice quarter sections where we are. So generally it's uh five to six quarter mile swipes of millet. We'll do them four to five days for 500 cows. And then so that's what we'll make our first three or four paddocks in the fall. And if those paddocks all last six days, then we'll we'll cut them back one swath to try and get back to our four to five day system because anything we've just found anything over five days that they make a mess and they they leave too much and I, I also noticed anything over five days their manure changes too much for my likings um like it's stacking yeah it'll stack for two days instead of just a one day so if we run a four to five day program their manure is the same for day one to four and it'll stack on day five. If we run a six or seven or eight day program, the manure will be perfect for five days and then it'll stack for three. So we found that it's probably a little easier on the rumen doing the shorter days and the cows seem to be more content on the four to five day move. And it's good training for the cows too. For sure. I got more questions, but it's gonna have to wait till question time. <laughs> But Put I don't know water watering, and I, I should have, I honestly, I should have given the other guys uh, the chance to touch on this. We'll come back to it at uh, at the question period. But this, we honestly get asked this so much uh, about winter watering systems. We should do a webinar on it. But why don't you talk about uh, your system, pros, cons, and like I joked to you, how long does it take to unthaw? So about uh, 10 years ago, when we started swath grazing, we swath graze a quarter right beside the yard, so it was easy to give them water. And then we realized that you can only grow millet back to back twice, or else we run into weed issues and a bit of a mess. And then it lays down lots because of that of nutrients from the manure. So we, we try and rotate it with our corn that we grow for silage for feed. So we started uh, purchasing solar systems. And I am not a huge advocate for solar systems. And the simple reason is, is we have too many cows. So when we would swath graze 500 cows on a solar system, when we had a month like January with no sunshine and hoar frost every day, it would be dead by day three. And I ran a gas power generator down there for the other 27 days and it bothered me. And we invested a fair bit of money in getting four systems going and getting dugouts set up for them. And the one winter we had, when we had the sunshine all winter, we, we drained dugouts just that many cows, that many gallons of water. And it was a definitely different for us because we're used to feeding them silage. So their water consumption goes way up when the feed that they're eating is under 10% moisture instead of 65. Um, so we, 
put in a big cost of trenching um, well water down to where our land is that we swath graze. So we trenched well water a mile and three quarters and put a powerless water bowl in every half a mile. So we swath graze along the way down there on different spots. Lots of times we put, uh, we put city water shutoffs at each one of them so we can shut them off, pump them out so they don't need to be uh, used all winter. And this one here that you're seeing in the picture in December when it was 45 below, you drive up just to check to make sure it's working. No ice, no nothing, no power. So Kyle, what, is, what does that mean, powerless water? Like so how does that, how do, how do you keep that unthought? 500 cows. Right. Water usage. So this one here is a two hole or two drinker system. Um, it's, I don't like it as much. We have a couple of the rectangle ones that have five drink holes in them and that hold 400 gallons of water. Uh, so it's the water temperature takes so long to drop that it doesn't freeze. So this one only holds about a hundred gallons of water. And on a really cold day, if you don't have enough cattle on this one, it will give you some issues, but the, the rectangle ones, Give us no issues and this one had 500 cows so we didn't have any issues at all and the other thing too is when we're winter feeding on this type of water bowl we have more trouble just because the cows always drink from 10 30 in the morning till two o'clock in the afternoon but while they're swath grazing the the lineup of cows doesn't change 24 hours a day so that that helps a lot to keep that system open and we put our mineral feeders between the feed area and the water. So if there's a big lineup, cows stop and stop at the mineral feeders on the way there. And that's one other thing too that we've found has been very important while we're swath grazing to make sure that there is a free choice mineral out for them. We feed a three to one mineral to them while they're doing it and their consumption stays the same on that stuff. They've been on it since the 10th of, the 10th of December till now and they use the same amount every day. They're pretty well close to their recommended 100 grams per cow per day, as long as it stays on their route that they take to get to the water. Right. Kyle, just quickly, you would mentioned, uh, I think, something important for people to hear, uh, not or earlier when we were chatting. Uh, it was a question that came up, straw. Do you use it? And I know the answer to this, of course, but it's like... Where do the cows lay? And uh, I mean, I see you've got bush around. At what point do the cows choose the bush over the swaths and vice versa? Yeah, so that was another learning experience for me from coming from a 150 cows, a calf in the wintertime that I was under the understanding they always had to sleep in a building or in four feet of straw. And then I was young and stupid, so I bought too many cows and we had 500 cows and I took them straw every day and the cows were dirty because we didn't take them enough. So we got two feet of snow and I quit taking it to them and they're cleaner and they're happier than they were before. So while we're swath grazing, if they, they always have natural bush to get out of the wind and they stand or they bed in the, the swaths they have open. And of course, in this part of Saskatchewan, there's uh, there's cattail sloughs. So right now, actually, there's about a 25 acre slough out in there uh swath grazing field and that's their bedding area they go in there um my biggest issue with using straw is the cost of it the time to putting it out and on day five they will not go clean up your swaths if you give them straw to eat where they sleep so um it's economics and to be honest the cows have adapted um my dad's old cows that calved in a barn and slept in a building and slept in straw every night, never had hair on their udders. And now the cows do, they've figured out how to change it and they excel in our system now. So it doesn't seem to be an issue. And like I said, for four of the five days they're in that paddock, they have a swath to lay in. That's got lots of insulation. You go out on a day like today when there's uh, not, lot, not a bunch left to eat, there's cows laying on top of the hill in the fresh snow, chewing their cud. So. And when you're moving them all the time, they're not on packed snow all the time. So they're they're in fresh snow and have access to bush. And we like to swath graze where there is bush. So when it when the weather does get bad, they can they go hunker down in the trees for 
the day when it's windy. And then that's the other thing that we had to mindset change was, you know, our, my dad was under the understanding that when it's windy and snowing and blowing that you have to go feed them that day because the cows aren't eating. But if you uh, go back out there at seven o'clock at night, when the wind goes down, then all the cows are grazing because we didn't take their feet away. Mother nature just let them go back and eat. So we, uh, and if you ever do go out and feed them, be prepared that you're going to feed them every day for the rest of the winter. Yeah. You just feed them that. <laughs> if it gets tough, they just come and talk at the gate and you'll be nice to them. So, and these cows in particular, the, our feed truck that delivers silage to the other cows drives right by them every day. And they do not come to the fence wanting that corn silage to come in there. If you they did know, it once though, they would. Yeah. They know what their job is and they quite enjoy what they're doing. Just don't spoil them or else they'll expect it every day. Food, water, and shelter. They don't need us if, as long as you provide them that. Yep, absolutely. Well said. All right, well, great job, Kyle. Again, we went well over time, but that was awesome. And there were a shit ton of questions came in, so stick around. Uh, Rob, if you uh, want to unmute yourself, turn your video on. Um, so Rob Wonder from Foam Lake. Uh, Rob, uh, his family has been swath grazing for a while. I don't think they've done it this year, um, but we got some great pictures from Rod, R Rob and... Uh, He's a great guy to, to chat with and BS about this kind of stuff with. So Rob, tell us about your farm, where you farm, what you farm. And uh, yeah, we'll get into her, bud. Well, good. Yeah. Uh, Rob Wonder, I farm just south of Foam Lake, Saskatchewan. Uh, that's the, in the picture there is the original homestead that my great, great, great grandfather built in 1893 or four. Um, we're we're a family farm, so I farm with my folks and uh, my brother and 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 our wives, and uh, we're a mixed mixed operation. Um, and we're heavily very integrated with the live livestock going on our grain land, and what grain land becomes pasture, and vice versa. We kind of try and rotate it all around. Uh, you know, we use. I actually phoned my dad to see ask him like when did you start swath grazing and he was like well i think maybe maybe the like he's like the late night 80s i just did a bit or early 90s early 90s and uh you know he yeah you do things that it was just part of of he just i don't think my dad really enjoyed cleaning corrals and, <laughs> uh, which i'm forever grateful because he's a lot more open to trying different things and over the years it's just kind of evolved from growing just a, a German millet or whatever the cheapest millet was to a more of a mix, mix in our op, mixed uh, diverse cover crop. And like the picture there, that's just uh, cleaned out the shed and just tremendous. So, um, you know, something else that we've started doing here the last, which lots of people do is, is, uh, is swath grazing our residue. Uh, so <clears throat> growing a cash crop with a cover crop like a relay crop together to enhance that palatability of our straw. And with the way the price of land is going, we just, and to rent land, you have to be, uh, I just love stacking enterprises on an acre. I, I excel at that. So here you can see uh, the picture of the straw that that's what our oat straw looked like. What do you got, what do you got going uh, on there, Rob? What's in there? That's sweet clover, uh, hairy vetch, three types of ryegrass uh, and and oats. So, and that worked good. I was able to spray the oats, uh, just kind of stunted all the cover crop and let that oats just bounce. And and uh, so oats, you know, combined a really a nice crop of oats, good, good grain yield on it. And then unfortunately this year, our, our the snow was so deep and then we got warm and cold and it turned to cement. So we had to, had to pull the pin, uh, it probably wouldn't have, but we were learning from last winter that we, you know, eventually we just got a, we, we waved the white hat. It was costing us too much to try and get them to, to work through it. So, so that's, uh, you know, we're something that we, we try and do a bit of that. And so then we'll, you know, we'll kind of, look at the whole system look at the whole farm and see what we're, where we need feed and so the, i knew we were going to have a lot of oat straw to residue to put through the cows so we didn't necessarily need to fill that window with swath grazing 
uh, in the years past, we've, you know, you come off grass and residue and we're still cows on calves and you throw them out on that, out on that, uh, out on swath grazing. And, and that's cheap cost of gain right there. Uh, those cows are, cows are milking and the calves are, 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 are getting a bit of milk and, and, and putting on some, on some weight and they come in nice and shiny and, and you send them steers to town and you get the check and you still don't think it's enough, but it's better <laughs> than, uh, they it's look never, good leaving. You're proud of that set of calves leaving the farm, I guess. So, uh, yeah. Well, and the other picture, quick, oh, quick. quick. Uh, I know I, I, I'm trying to be put my uh, perspective on the people that are watching. So, like, how good of a job did those cows clean that residue up? Oh yeah. You know we'll we'll have no issues on the on the quarter section that we were on there. You know we're, we we were. We got about 80 acres cleaned up. Won't be an issue at all. It'll be maybe, maybe left 20, 10, 15%. You know, they'll, uh, we were supplementing them with a little bit of hay. Uh, just after last winter, we got so gun shy of, of losing condition on our cows that some years we'll use, some years, years we'll use grain. And, and this year just, looked like the hay was right beside it so we were kind of doing that and then same time we're we're unrolling hay bales or spreading those hay bales out on sandier patches sour patch like targeting where we're putting that extra residue right so i actually rent that quarter of land that that we're doing that on and the land guy was a little upset that there was a that there the residue hadn't gone through a chopper and i just explained it all to them and I've got pictures from doing that in the past where you know there's some sandy patches where the oats was actually this year so green and lodged that left it didn't even couldn't didn't even try and combine it belts are way too expensive for that four bushels of oats so we just left it for the cows to clean up but then you just see the line right down to next to not like very low right and it's a drastic mark and so you know, show a few pictures like, like I'm, I'm not, I'm just manipulating where the carbon is going. I'm not taking away. I'm, I'm enhancing that. I'm upcycling it as Dwayne Thompson would say, running it through that cow. And those girls are making, like they're working for us. And, and that combination of those things is what pulled us through the, pulled us through 21 because the, we thought we had lots of feed, but you do something like this and you still have bales or whatever, feed sources that you would have been using through that window and those cows aren't necessarily writing us a check for those bales but they they're there and and uh, all of a sudden check. you're not writing a check for to buy additional feed that exactly right like man bales are 200 bucks and nobody and everybody was you know the, the guys like good for them they made some money that year and we all need to make some money but it was kind of a tough pill to swallow so it's just building resilience into the whole system and, and uh, adding profit wherever we can. Um, that other picture there with the yellow, bright yellow swaths, that's just a cutting some sweet clover that we're gonna silage. So this picture <clears throat> here, you can see that's actually just a residue from years past. And uh, you could just skip ahead, Joe, that's good. I'll cover that silage part off after. Sure. Um, Sorry, I think I must be on a little delay. Which which one do you, which grazing one do you want? Uh, that yeah, that's that's good there. So we would do, uh, you know, we would break them down into uh, we break them down in, into like depending on life and everything. We would juggle our moves, but when we first started swath grazing, my dad was religious. We moved them at least once a day. I've grown up, remember using these shitty black electric, those reels that broke and that little wire. And it was, you know, it was good. It, it, it built character in us because you get told that you got to hold the wire tight and you got to, you know, you had to pay attention on the end of it. But uh, now with, with Polly and our cattle, like moving cattle so much that, that honestly, if we get to a quarter and we don't have power, I'm okay with that for a few days. I am not recommending that people start there. Uh, you should have your fences hot enough that it scares you. 
uh, because once they go the other way, then it's really hard to, once they lose that respect, it's hard to get it back till there's a good ground, obviously. So uh, we were on these pictures here, like that mix, uh, apparently the, the combines were thrown over more oats than we thought because the cattle were gaining weight and we actually, the, 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 the manure was very nice. So we actually didn't have to supplement on that. So, you know, it's just a real variance. Um, can really you know it really depends with us we try to try to keep good good condition on our cows but still make them work and still you know kind of keep it all as much money in our po back pocket as we can and and over the course of time we've just you know I remember the first year we did some pretty intensive chaff pile grazing and and there was like another layer to the cutting to the culling because dad had you know he, he was sometimes he's a little bit more forgiving than i i have no forgiveness but you know the cows always held their condition so that wasn't an issue but but you get them to take them to another level of working and all of a sudden they're just kind of dropping out and now when we're when we're you know we do preg checks we're always very happy and and uh just kind of trying to keep that whole system uh working together so so Rob, um, on, on something like this, if I understood you correct, this would have been like a barley crop where you're throwing up, you know, you, I assume you have a John Deere combine like me and you're throwing over a decent amount. <laughs> yeah, you, <laughs> and then yeah you betcha. And that's, that's regrowing through the straw. So we got vegetative as hell, barley this high mixed with a high carbon uh, uh, energy source. I mean, that would make some pretty unbelievable feed. Yeah, sometimes it works out that it works out like that, and just depends on our falls. Um, we've gotten <clears throat> some years we're combining just before the snow's going to hit us, and just the just our kind of our environment, so it's not as good. But then they get the full grain because it's tougher, I think, and you're just and you know how harvest for us harvest and. When it's August fifteenth, the combine is set like a fine tooth comb, and when it's October fifteenth, it's like, uh, <laughs> how's it going? Like, how much are you throwing over? I have no idea. It's coming in the <laughs> probably coming in the tank. <laughs> yeah, and we're gonna have to dry it. So whatever. Well, I, I, I think I'll ask you the same question, Rob, as I asked Kyle. Like, what are you looking for? Uh, like, because it. Like there's probably a little less protein in the in that feed source, depending on like when you get at like that vegetative uh, regrowth. It's like, what are you looking for when you move? Is it their shit? Is it the residue? Is it condition? Or is it the temp? The forecast? Yeah, so a little bit of everything, right? Looking at their, looking at the manure and uh, you know condition and of the cattle, and then the. The residue is is actually probably the last thing. I mean, it's it 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 seems like it's the first thing, but but when you kind of get in there and check on them a bit and see, and I, like Kyle said, like if they don't come up looking for you, then then we just kind of leave them alone because you know they're definitely happy, right? And and uh, trying to pick out, we do try and pick some of the if there's. We always pull our younger herd out, our younger ones out, and run them separate. But if we this year we pulled some thinner cows that were just just not going to cut it, so we pulled them out of there too, just to kind of so we have a uniform group going into it. Um, and then yeah, it you know if it's if it's warm, they can definitely take that lower. And we're not like we're calving into you know end of April now, so we're we don't need to have a you know we're doing this through you know november december right into to the new year if we can just depending on the weather but so we kind of as we get further down the line into the trimesters then we're going to try and watch what we're doing a little more closely but we're trying to you know as you tailor that calving window to your to your environment so all of a sudden you're able to put through some poor quality stuff and it's it's not the end of the world and there's a fresh paddock if the weather should turn on you too, right? Yeah, and like I, I think I stole it from Steve Kenyon. Like he calls it blizzard bales. Like somewhere I'll have something set up. So if it turns to a three day or four day 
blizzard and the wind's howling and and there's, there's no place good to go you can open a wire and and the cows go into fresh bush and fresh bales and and we when we first started like if we give them a bale it seemed like we fed them a bit and then they just spoiled them but and then at some point it, you have to have a back you have to draw the line like no girls you there's nothing wrong with you going out and going to get it today and and eventually now we could we were actually in december the way that set up we were full feed with like we were giving some free choice straw with the hay or whatever but it was so brutal that we we just fed them and then as soon as the weather turned or calmed down you know two days later they were all out grazing we just drive do a road drive by first before you made the decision but you know you they would go right back out there so to me they prefer to go out and and, and work for it you know i i think you touched on an important point that actually kyle did too um what changed my life uh with cows i mean not necessarily so much swath grazing but bale grazing we bale graze on three week paddocks now uh it changed my relationship with our cows because instead of being a little pissed off every day getting a 40 year old tractor going and going and feeding those cows and thinking you know why are you so hard on me and i have to take care of you it changed to you would go and see the cows not because you had to but because you wanted to and it made you more observant and understanding that, okay, they got lots of feed, they got water, just how calm the cows are. You know, you take a look at the manure, you know, uh, uh, things are calm and you, it just allows you to be more observant rather than it's another chore to do that day, like a literal chore you have to do every day. So I think it's like one thing that it helped me is it's like, again, like it changed my relationship with my cows and made me observant and rather than you are completely dependent on me. It's like, you can give, I can give you everything you need. And I know something's wrong because something's different. Right. Right. Yeah. Yeah. No, that's right. Uh, so, do you want to just go? Oh, sorry. Go ahead, Joe. Sorry. No, I, I think we are in a bit of a delay, but I got your silent picture up whenever, uh, whenever you want to talk about it, Rob. Yeah. So in 21, uh, was the closest that I have. I mean, we've, we've cut sweet clover silage and that was a more of a mix and that was, I'm glad we did it. Uh, so you just start, like, I really like enjoy doing numbers now. I don't think you, I would have ever thought that in my younger days, but anyway, um, like with land values at rent at between 80 and a hundred dollars an acre, if you're going to, feed cows on that if that acre is going to be devoted to feeding cows hopefully we're we're cutting a high high legume crop at the beginning of the season and still having that window to to actually get a, a swath grazing crop seeded so that you know you you do that and and all of a sudden you're looking instead of compare that to running hay on your operation and it's just a total game changer because all of a sudden those perennials, you can just graze those perennials through the summer and you can do, you can add another enterprise or, you know, or do a better job of it or just run more cows or however you want to do that or just grow extra grass and just stockpile it for next year. But you, you take that, you know, a good producing uh, grain quarter and, and you, you take a silage cut like in 21, that stuff was about six and a half tons ish an acre. Um, <clears throat> and when we were putting it in the pile, we took a bricks at it and it was, it was 28 bricks going into the pile. Mm. So tremendous. And the chopper was covered in pollen and it was like it, it, a lot of things lined up. Uh, I've had it, I've had it go the other way too, where it rained for a month and it was garbage, but, but then going right in and seeding behind it uh, so that you get that you know, you continue to have that vegetative root growing. Uh, in 21, it just didn't look like it was going to uh, work out because it was already starting to dry up to the point I didn't think I'd get the drill in the ground. So I just left the clover and alfalfa and chicory and stuff regrow. And then I grazed that in the fall. So it's still a, a double, kind of a double hit, but but eventually the goal will be to, to take off a nice silage crop and then just graze that silage pile in the field 
after or in conjunction with with swath grazing on those same acres. So you might give up a little bit on the swath grazing days. Like you might, instead of getting a hundred, you might be at 60, but to me, that's just 60 extra days, just a bonus. And, and you can, if we time it right, and then just think of all the other benefits behind that. And then you go in behind that after into a cash crop of something and cut your nutrition fertilizer requirements back. Like that's just me speaking like I wouldn't recommend that someone who's just starting this to try that do that maybe try it on a small amount or you know make sure you're comfortable with what could could happen but that with experience tells me that I can get away with doing that and so if with the way that inputs have been you 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 start to add all this stuff together and and all of a sudden those cows don't cost you nearly as much to keep so that's kind of yeah Amen. Capture sunlight, grow plants, uh, reduce costs on cows. You grow more plants, you reduce your cost. You, you betcha. All right. Well, great job, Rob. Guys, if, if everyone wants to unmute themselves and turn the video on, we got a, we got a bunch of questions to get through here. Um, oh, stop. I'm stopping here. Nice. We got all of us here. Hey, uh, first question, you guys, I've got a list on the board uh, kind of behind the screen here, but uh, I got a whole bunch of questions online I got to go through. Um, I, I, I think, I, I mean, I'm always curious about it, but we've never seen it, but people ask all the time, um, what do you see as far as, uh, oh, and I, I know you, you haven't done it long enough to do soil tests, but what do you see as far as fertility left in the field? And do you see these waves? where the where the swath was versus yeah you know um we're in between the swaths so Kyle maybe we'll start with you and then Rob and then oh if you want to uh we had a time lapse on on uh yours this year so you've got a kind of an interesting insight but Kyle I don't know if you've ever done soil tests I probably depends where it's going in the ground but what you've seen as far as fertility um as a rule our we try and grow corn where we swath grazed last year for the Simple fact that whatever else we grow seems to lay down. So there's uh, obviously a lot of added nutrients. So, and as a rule, we try and use a, we'll float on some of our fertilizer for our corn and use a high speed disc and incorporate that fertilizer and the manure in on a 45 degree angle, spread that manure out. So we don't see the waves in the field that you're talking about, but it's the new, like the nutrients is there we've soil sampled it and we're we're able to cut back our fertilizer on our corn substantially and if i grow barley grow anything else there the next year we have issues with it so we try to grow corn where we had millet and then it's a good way of since we can't use a fall application of uh roundup it's a good way to clean up our land again the next the following year so yeah hasn't been in the residue hasn't been an issue, but the, the added nutrients is an issue if it's not managed for sure. Rob? Yeah, I, I, I don't know if we've, how many soil tests we've done after it, but just gone off observations and, and uh, <clears throat> yeah, cutting that, cutting fertility rate back, or sometimes we're not using any anyways, but we'll be, you know, maybe just a slight starter. We did corn and one year we, after our corn grazing, we cut our fertility back to just, just a, just a trickle and our yield was, uh, was no different. Uh, you know, so we're site, we're definitely cycling nutrients. It's not leaving and it's staying right, right there. Haven't really haven't seen those, uh, like any kind of a waving effect and, and, uh, yeah, as far as residue, it's it depends on which field and whose field it is, but uh, I'll just seed through it, and if it's dad's, we'll spread it around. But nonetheless, it, it's it, usually by the time the cows are done and you can go back in the spring if there's something, if you're worried, and they can clean it up further too sometimes. So when it's one thing I'll add to that, Joe, yep. is... Um, well, I never really touched on cow days per acre before, but that's kind of something 
it it's coming. I swear. Yeah. <laughs> There's a lot of good questions here. I, hopefully, you guys. Well, my cow days and acre, I think, reflects highly on how much nutrients we got to give next year's crop. Yeah, for sure. We we've, we've varied anywhere from 160 to we broke a new record of 205 cow days an acre this year. That 205 cow days an acre, there is there is manure out there. It's it's unbelievable. But when there's that many cows on that piece of ground for that many days, it's just like taking manure spreader out on that acre. Well, and, and you can you, there, right? So it's you can choose. You can start doing calculations on the protein and, and nitrogen credits. I mean, I know once we deal with biology, it's like you can throw math out the fucking window because it's, I mean, it's, <laughs> I mean, we're dealing with living biology here, but it's like, yeah, it's like there is a shit pile of nutrients and they stayed directly on the field. It's like you captured one pile of energy in that growing season and it didn't go anywhere. You didn't, you didn't export nothing. Um, so yeah, that's a, that's a really good point, Kyle. Oh, you had a time lapse camera up the year after yours. Like, what'd you see? Yeah, it was really interesting. I I expected or assumed that where I had the swath, I would see uh, darker, greener plants, better fertility, and good, bad, or otherwise. I sowed right through that residue where you could see most of the ground. It was the year where they cleaned it up really well. Saw nothing on that time lapse camera. You cannot see where the rows were whatsoever. And I didn't harrow. I didn't do anything. We just sowed right through it. And it was, uh, yeah, we could not see any difference. Had a wonderful full season cover crop this year. So there was obviously lots of fertility there. Um, but I didn't notice anything. So I'm, that maybe that's, I don't know whether that's necessarily a great thing either. Like I kind of thought, why wouldn't I see more fertility in those rows? But uh, yeah, it was really, really, it was really interesting. And uh, yeah, overall the crop was great. I think the cow, the cow spreads it out for you a lot. Yeah, and for sure. Mm -hmm. we, uh, we can see where they shit, but we can't see where they piss. So that that's the. Yeah, part of it, I think we forget. Well, I'm going to get my cows trained to pee just in the row, then I guess is what I'll start working for. <laughs> so you can see the difference. Yeah, <laughs> that's right. Yeah. Okay, guys, we got, sorry, we got a bunch of questions we got to get to here. Uh, freeze thaw. I'm sure uh, every one of you has experienced that in some way. Um, so, yeah, the question was they had a lot of snow last winter in Alberta. They it thawed and then froze, and I guess, uh, grazing less efficient so um oh we'll start with you you've probably got the least amount of experience then rob then kyle but uh yeah your experience on thaw and then freezing yeah i don't have a whole lot of experience at just doing it for the few years we've done it um i think it would be an issue but i think it was rob mentioned like going out and flipping it up with a tractor i think once and i mean and kyle kind of alluded to this once those cows know that they're there that swath there i i really think maybe a little bit of help even maybe i kind of wondered if maybe driving a tractor down the row if you had to to break the crust um but the more i the little bit i've done it and talk listen to these guys tonight uh, who've just been excellent like i i'm kind of starting to wonder if it would have to be a pretty serious scenario with a 25 or bigger foot swath where the cows couldn't access it at all even if you had to do a little bit of help i think uh i think they'll find it especially if they know it's there so that's just my opinion, and I'm, and I'm not basing that on a lot of experience, just listening to the guys like these talk about it. Rob? Yeah, in all the years that we've been doing it, you know, there's this is probably one of the worst years for it, just, just the way that those those the freeze thaws worked. And we've had close to five feet of snow, or probably more than five feet of snow where I'm at. And so it's just... Like now we've got a, a layer of, of cement. You could probably drive the tractor over it and it wouldn't even break through it. So, uh, but that's kind of a, a anomaly or it's not normal, I don't think. And if there, if it's that snow is even slightly crusted, like they'll dig through a lot. And if, when the quality is good, like they will, they want that. They prefer that swath grazing, that, that beautiful green swath over anything. And they'll, they'll really dig for it, but you just have to just have to be paying attention to it and just be adaptive in, in how we manage it, I think is the best thing we can do. It's what we found anyway. Kyle? Um, I wonder if the question isn't more alluding to when the swaths are open, the freeze thaw. Um, this this winter's probably been our worst for that. If they're on day two, day three of the swath and we get to plus four and it's minus 15 at night, it kind of freezes that 
residue into the ground. And that's probably, I'm wondering if that's where that question's coming from. And we struggle with it a little bit. Um, again, if it's not too cold out the next day, I would advise just look the other way for a day. And we were lucky enough this year, we got through all of that. And then we were able to just feed them a half ration and they went back and cleaned that clean that residue up, even though it was tough to get, but they were able to get half the ration from the feed truck before we moved to the next field. So I guess that's probably a scenario if they're opening it up on day three, that, that type of thing, and it's getting freeze thaw, maybe just have to put out some type of feed for half ration or quarter ration to get them to clean it up. But as far as that going into a new paddock, I've never had issues. Um, like, Rob was saying lots of snow up to a foot of snow over top of the swath and they'll find it 40 foot swath. It won't have too much on top of it. So got a question just for Kyle here. And actually I was kind of wondering the same thing because we used airplane cable for years and just, I don't know if I'm getting weaker in my old age, but the reel was damn heavy. So question is how many feet of aircraft cable on a reel? And is it three sixteenths Kyle? And are you reeling that by hand or have you got, uh, what have you got it for unrolling and rolling out? Uh, Joe, I sent you a picture of this thing that I use. It's a uh, 7L makes them. It's a blue reel, holds the small reels hold just under a half a mile of cable. And we use a cordless DeWalt drill to reel them in. And we're usually pulling in about a quarter mile of fence at a time. And two, three minutes of bringing a quarter mile of fence in with a drill zero hand cranking involved. The only time that we have to hand crank is when we are uh, setting up a new one, we'll roll it out and then use hand crank four turns to tighten it up. And I, I don't believe it would be 3 I think it'd be smaller than that. Um, big. Yeah, 3 seems big. This stuff's very fine. It's smaller than high tensile wire. Yeah. These reels work extremely well and I hook them on the post and then I, uh, tie the other end on to the mirror of my $2,500 Ford Ranger side-by-side -side and drive to the other end. So. Nice. And you're doing that in summer? No, right now. Oh, you're doing it now. Okay, perfect segue. What are you guys using for posts? Uh, Kyle, you start, and then Owen, then Rob. How are you uh, going to post three bar, About three feet long, and we put them in the ground about four inches when it's time to take them out, take a pair of ice grips, give them a half a turn, and they'll pop out of the ground. We've tried several different things, and I've yet to find one that can replace a piece of rebar, and it is the cheapest thing that you can find. And oh. don't put them in too far in the winter when it's nice and warm out because you still have to take them out in January. So <laughs> that's our biggest trouble is when we go put them in in November, three swats with the sledgehammer, and they're in a long ways, and then I'm cursing that person in January when I'm taking them out. No shit. <laughs> oh, uh, we um, I, I I did it early enough this year. I I actually went and pushed just pigtail step in posts. The ground was just soft enough I could get them in far enough, and I just went ahead of myself and set up where I knew I wanted my reel, and then a little bit of wiggle and stuff. They came out pretty good. Um, something I'm I tried I'm trying bale grazing this year. Uh, my dad had this idea. We had old white step in posts. You can put more than one. They like they've got different levels. Yeah, And we have, I mean, like every farm, we've got a million old five gallon chop pails that are garbage. The handles are broke off. So one afternoon we stuck a bunch in through the, the hole where the oil comes out and uh, poured water in there and let them freeze. And now I just carry those pails around for bale grazing. And I'm going to, I'll try more of that um, for swath grazing, I think. I mean, they're a little awkward and stuff, but that way there's no ground. The ground can be frozen at all. You kind of push it down in the snow. Um, it's sure we're good for bale grazing so far anyway. So, and it kind of seems more of a visual thing with cows or our cows. Anyway, I've tried, you know, just stringing a wire wire out or putting a step in, in a bale and stuff like that. And they seem to not respect it, but a post on the ground, they seem to have a little more respect for it. I think they're just, they're just used to it. Rob. Oh, I got great, great. I'm excited to freeze a bunch of pails up tomorrow. Um, <laughs> hey, you haven't heard my option yet. I got a good one too. <laughs> <laughs> okay <laughs> right on yeah we just use rebar and and uh and pound them in and then just uh like a if the vice grip or uh like a like a 
10 inch or eight inch pipe wrenches, light, easy to carry, and you can spin around and got a handle to pull them out. And honestly, once the, if the snow is deep enough, you, you almost don't even need to go into the ground, just depending on your wildlife pressure, I guess, but you can just usually just sink them in the snow and, and they'll be there. And I think, I think the, a good point is just knowing your, your paddock side or knowing how often you want to move because that's going to keep your cows trained to your fence. And, and then you, you know, you only, that post is only going to hold them for, it's not there forever, right? It doesn't have to withstand a hurricane. It just has to hold them there for, for those three or four days. And that, that also works back to if you open up a whole bunch of swaths at once and then you get a blizzard and then you're pretty much hooped on those swaths as, from what we've found, right? So that's, that's why to, to do that, you know, for like, like Kyle said, the five days is a sweet spot for them. And, and I think that's a really something that I would write that down and, and remember that one because it's it's taken some expensive learning lessons to get to that point, I'm sure. Yeah, and we just use straight fiberglass posts. You can buy them in a pack. They're like cheap. I assume they're cheap, but our farm depends on them. If we lost all those posts, I assume we quit farming. Uh, I come to my auction sale. I don't know how many of those posts I'm going to have, but a lot. And uh, plastic clip on top, like Kyle said, if you drive them in the ground two inches, they're there till spring. But if you drive them in the ground one inch, pliers, half a turn, yoink, and they come out. It works really good. Little steel clip. Um, one downside is with poly wire or, uh, or uh, airplane cable. If you got a knot, doesn't work good, doesn't flow through there for shit, but works really good for uh, getting a post in the ground um, uh, in, in winter if need be. Um, so somebody touched on this, I don't know who it was, but uh, we had a few people ask this, uh, wildlife. Anyone have issues with wildlife? Rob, we'll start with you, Kyle, then oh. Yeah. Right now, the one group of cows, I'm also feeding about 250 white tails. Uh, and so it is, a, it is an issue for me. Uh, and and it, everyone says, well, deer respect fence. And, and the deer that live here all year don't touch my fence. But the other 100 that come over to camp out for the winter have no idea what fence is. And so it's, it, it is a bit of a struggle. That being said, this is really the only only spot on the farm that that we have this much trouble with it usually you know usually it's it's not a big deal um so i just have to adapt i just can't just can't have cows here for a couple of winters will i would think will help if i move remove the feed the deer are just gonna have to eat stockpile grass Kyle? uh we're, we're pretty lucky we don't have too much issues where we swath graze um only issues we have is before the cows get there, the deer will be out there and they'll knock the odd fence down. So it uh, seems like once we get the 500 cows there, nobody else wants to live with them in the trees. So the deer seem to leave. Um, biggest thing we have is just going to check that next fence that we move them into. Because before the cows have been there, it's really hard to get around out there right now. So once the cows have grazed that paddock, it's really easy to go roll up that fence, but it's hard to go check the next one because they haven't packed a path for their side by side to go get to. So, but yeah, we don't we don't have a lot of issues just on our upcoming fences. Sometimes the deer will knock a few insulators off, and that is the downfall of rebar. If it's touching the rebar post or grounded out and losing a fair bit of voltage. So, oh. Uh, no, I really don't. Um, uh, Rock Lake is eight miles north of me, um, so all the deer hang out there. Uh, last winter, there was a herd of elk got within four or five miles of me, um, which has me a little nervous for the future if they keep coming farther south. Um, but no, we have very few deer. Not far away, there's thousands. Oh, I'm just really lucky where they are. But um, these elk herds that are moving into our area and, and staying longer do have me a little worried um, for the future, yeah. I'm just not sure uh, 75 elk in a swath grace or bale grace field for that matter. That uh, that's I'm, I'm scared of that. Yeah. We do have big herds of elk in our area as well. Um, if they find it before the cows get there, it's an issue, but they do not like being there when your cows are there. Okay. So if, if they move in, get the cows there right away. 
So we got a good question here, guys. I'm positive every one of you has thought about this. How much feed waste, uh, how much would the feed waste go up if the crop was left standing? So producer that has a uh, warm season blend uh, wants to leave it standing and grazing. What do you guys think as far as losses uh, in a swath versus just standing? And of course, this is gonna depend on a lot of variables, but I'm sure probably you guys have uh, done an unintentional uh, trial where you've left a little bit standing. What does it look like once the cows go through there? Oh, actually, I think you told me about uh, a piece you left. Um, so we'll go Owen, Kyle, and then Rob. Yeah, well, I borrowed the neighbor's swather and I went to get back in it after supper and the GPS had moved the foot over and I was afraid to touch any buttons. So I just went the length of the field and left the left two feet of a, that's a, of standing that's a cattle crop. farmer right there. I just didn't want to touch it. Um, <laughs> no, they, uh, and, and it, those cows, uh, yeah, they, they, they almost, they didn't prefer the standing stuff, but they, it was just like a swath, right? Cause there was a foot the whole way down the, or two feet or whatever. Um, so I don't think the waste would be any worse. I think on the edges of fields, like with corn grazing, when snow blows in, you'd lose a lot, but I think in the field where they could access it, I don't think it's a waste that would concern me. It's the quality of feed. I think you would lose a lot, a lot of quality of feed. Like I cut that sorghum too late. Right. And they, and, and then if you leave it stand, everything's going to be as mature as mother nature allowed it to get in, in the fall. And I, I think you'd lose a lot of quality. Like, I don't know whether a spring calving cow, I'd be really comfortable having her go right through on just standing warm season. Or maybe I'm wrong about that. Maybe, maybe it could be meaner, but I, that's just how I feel. I think that'd be, that'd be iffy. Kyle? Uh, in my area, it doesn't work. Uh, too much snow. Standing millet and a foot of snow will be a matted snow millet mess. We've, I've left some little three acre corners and they tramp three quarters of it and they eat the heads off it and they leave the rest. So hasn't worked for me. And I don't know, you guys probably all know what millet does. If we let it get that mature, I'm not sure that the grain's still in the heads by the time we get there. And yeah, it, it just fills in with snow because anywhere in this year, if we left a foot of stubble, there's a foot of snow. If we left four inches of stubble, there's four inches of snow. So if there's a four foot, stand a millet everywhere i'm pretty sure i know how deep the snow would be in there so and to me the swathing is probably the cheapest part of the whole system so might as well do it to preserve the the feed quality of the swath and when we put it in a swath the top three inches of the swath will turn color and the bottom of the swath still looks like the day we put it there so if we uh, leave it all standing i'm pretty sure it would all be yellowed off and wouldn't be quite as enjoyable for the cow Rob? Yeah, I'm going to go to the famous answer. It always depends on what you're trying to do. Uh, everybody's kind of touched on it. but And the other thing to consider is uh, how long are you going to rely on that piece? Like if it's a 40-acre piece and that's only going to last you for, with your cow numbers, that's only going to be a week and you're going to be there. And, and depending on the species that you're using, like you're only going to be there for for you know, 10 days, maybe not. But if you're planning to, to carry that cow through the winter, yeah, you, you should be swathing it. And then the other, other thing that in there is that there is a hidden benefit to running that, running a swather over the field. You do kind of set your thistles back and all your, all those tougher weeds that you're not going to get to spray, but you cut them off, you know, you starve that root in a different, different, uh, different way. So there's, there's other hidden benefits to cutting it, but you, yeah, if you're trying to put gain condition or carry them through the winter, absolutely, I would, I would just swath it. Uh, we did a trial when the swather broke, and then it froze really hard, and we didn't get, so we left it because we were worried about nitrates. Uh, but we were only in there for, you know, two weeks, so it wasn't the end of the world. And they cleaned it up really well, and it was good, but the quality in the swath was it was night and day different and so knowing you know just kind of having a bit of a plan as to what you're doing but i mean uh, to to run a swath across now in the grand scheme of it like Kyle said is pretty cheap one so, other point that i would add to that too is it gives you a nice place to build a fence yeah so yeah we use a swath where we got 40 feet 
of stubble to build a fence down, and the cows don't even look in that piece to find something to eat, other than when we cross the swath. So if it's all standing, I think we'd have more fencing issues than we do now. So guys, I'm going to group these two together because uh, Kyle, you're using German millet. So uh, I'm pretty familiar with German millet. So just wondering your fertilizer rates on the German millet. Uh, if you use a herbicide, uh, kind of what you use and kind of what it controls. And are you going back, if you go back to back on swath grazing, do you, uh, I know you touched on a bit, but just talk about what you do as far as fertility. And then Owen and Rob, we got a question about uh, picking plant species for swath grazing. So Kyle, if you want to go first, just talk about kind of the actual management practices behind uh, the German millet. And then Rob and Owen will pick your brain a bit about the, the blends. Um, yeah, I, I don't, we used to grow German millet back to back. We did it a couple of times, did it two years in a row. And as a rule, I try not to do that now because we ran into weed issues and we ran into uh, lodging issues in the millet. So now we just rotate with corn, it's simple, easy for us to do. Um, we fertilize our millet because generally the millet's grown after we grow a crop of corn there. So we generally fertilize our millet just like we'd fertilize a, a crop of barley for silage or for grain. Um, we spray it with Pardoner, it's called. Um, it'll get rid of any of our thistles or that type of thing, and the crop works pretty good. The timing of that Pardoner is tough because millet likes to take its sweet time to come out of the ground and get the ground covered. So we we try and we make sure that the, the field is very clean when we seed it. This year, we actually sprayed it about three days after we seeded it and then sprayed it with Pardoner, you know, probably at four inches tall and did a good job of cleaning it up. And then once once that millet takes off, there isn't any weed that can compete with it. So that's what we do as a rule. And it, it's tough to know fertility of people's land or how much fertilizer to use, but we, we fertilize it just like we'd fertilize a crop of barley that we'd expect to grow 80 to 100 bushels of barley on or to grow eight to 10 tons of barley silage. That's how we fertilize it. And then we use the benefits of the millet in the corn. So we cut our corn fertility back by 25% as a rule. Cool. Um, well, oh, why don't you start, Howard? I know you're not using synthetics on your farm, but... Uh, just talk about why you chose the the plant species you did. Or, Joe, or, Gardner. If, or Joe Gardner told me the warm season blend would work good for swath grazing. So you should believe him. Yeah. <laughs> uh, no, everything we talked about warm season plants. Um, I don't. I generally, I'm trying to sow a fall crop like those pictures. So this year I've got 100 acres of fall rye in that I think will be good enough to graze or maybe make silage out of, and then I'm using the warm season plant because by the time I get it either grazed. Oh, I'm just going to, I'm going to, I'm going to pause you right there. Cause somebody asked, why didn't you just silage the fall rye? I did do a piece of fall rye silage. Um, the, where I grazed, I oh, had. Sorry, a, not silage. Why didn't you just swath graze the fall rye? Oh, it would have, um, because by the time to start with fall rye is not super palatable. Even the silage bales I have now, the cows just don't love them. They could live on them, but they just don't. This doesn't seem very palatable. Uh, so if if I would have had to swath the fall rye for a swath grazing purpose, I would have been swathing it in the second week of June to keep it palatable. And then that crop's going to lay there from June to November. And it's just going it, to, it's a cool season. Well, it's a biennial, but it's not going to, it's going to rot and it's going to take on a lot of moisture and it's going to get every single summer rain. So that's why I didn't. Um, but then just to touch on it, where I, the piece I grazed, where the, these pictures were from, um, a little bit of field history is different, but I had, you know, 25% more crop where I'd grazed the fall rye than I did where I took it for silage. And now that I'm trying to feed these bales and the cows don't love them, um, if the spring allows, I will graze any fall rye crops I have instead of uh, spending diesel fuel to make feed out of them. It will be plan A going forward. Plan B is always doesn't. I mean, it's funny. Dad and I were complaining about these quality of fall silage or these fall bales we had. And last year we would have killed somebody to have 400 bales sitting there right so we're, it's, we're a little spoiled this year we've got lots of other options but uh yeah i guess that's the answer to the question why i didn't rob just something to think about when it is ergot poisoning 
it, with that fall rye, like <clears throat> it is a bad thing that can happen and it's just ugly. So that's something to be mindful. I, you know, pick blend plants to species, different plants to, depending on what the resort, like what we're trying to accomplish in the soil, what's coming, what's come before it, what's coming after it, what time it's going in. There's a bunch of different things that I like to, that, that come to mind and, and what I'm trying to do uh, and what's going to be grazing it and how, like how long I want to try, like how I'm going to utilize that with the cow. I mean, just having kind of those checklists and then I'm always trying to structure it. So if we we're cutting it, if we're cutting it in September or I like to cut it later, uh, just the way I set up and then still having species like uh, rye grass or could be, you know, fall rye or winter trit seeded at a low rate underneath. So when you cut it off, it's green and then having some clovers in there. So you've got a something coming the following spring again. So that all of a sudden on one seeding, you're getting two grazings or three, depending on what, how you tailor it. Like it's very tough to answer that without, you know, just I can give people the questions that I use and then I just pick plants that, you know, like, okay, I, this field, it's, it's close to where we're going to be calving this year. So let's put, you know, let's put some fall rye in there. Let's put some, uh, some sweet clover and some red clover and some, you know, and then it's going to be after that, it's going into a cash crop. So let's throw turnips in that or some brassicas that are going to scavenge nitrogen through the growing season this year and then release it to the next crop. And, and uh, yeah, there's a lot of, a lot of moving parts. You can make it as simple or as complex as you want to. Like when I, like sometimes it's just the best thing you can do is clean out the shed, right? Just all this, everything goes in and, and whatever, see what you can. But from a soil health perspective, if we get in, getting some warm season grasses up here is a, it, it, there's a lot of benefit to them for the soil. It's going to grow fungal growth like seven times faster, I think, than a cool season well. So that's something too. And then, so you delay that seeding date and you're able to incorporate all these things and, and still, you know, keep all the, uh, check off many things, not just feeding the cows at a cost effective way, but also improving soil health at the same time. And maybe I'll just touch on it. Uh, yeah, I, I mean, I'm glad you guys uh, have talked about it as well, but I think there's such an uh, amazing opportunity with some of these warm season species to, I mean, we can just have such a phenomenal amount of growth. Uh, they use water 80% more efficiently than a cool season cereal. The soil is going to be warm by the time they're going in. So whether that's early June, late June, mid July, we can just put on capture a phenomenal amount of energy with a C4 grass. Uh, so we're capturing more photosynthetic energy in our system. Uh, and we can turn that into plant biomass that then our cattle uh, can break down, return to the soil, benefit from. So it's just, it's about, uh, I mean, it's about your system, but uh, growing more plants, I'm like, I think as cattle producers, we don't do that, uh, uh, I guess, efficiently enough. And there's a, you know, in a lot of cases, we have a short growing season. So getting some of these warm season plants in a place where they like can thrive a warm season plants maximizes growth at 30 degrees, a cool season plant shuts down. Again, we talked about water efficiency. Rob talked about the fungal component, the C4 grass aspect, the high energy. I think there's a, a very, uh, we're going to learn a lot more about these C4 grasses in the next 10, 20 years, because there's absolutely a fit in Western Canada uh, for cattle production for, I mean, not just swath grazing, any plant biomass uh, is welcome on a farm. The more you grow, the more you're going to have, the less re reliant you are on purchasing uh, feed, which is, I mean, if you're purchasing feed, your neighbors are purchasing, purchasing it too. And, and, you know, we see a year like 2021 where feeds 10 or 12 cents. So if we can grow more plants and put the right plants in the right stage, the right time, um, I think it, I think it'll go a long way. Um, so we're kind of getting down to it here, uh, guys. So I think I can answer this question, but I'll let you guys, uh, do you ever have trouble with sick cows, pneumonia, any issues with them being on the bald prairie? 
Kyle, why don't you go first, then Owen, then Rob. No, we don't have troubles with it. Um, I, I guess the one, one comment that comes to mind when I hear that question is, if they can't handle the system, they probably don't belong here. So we've had to change our mindset on that. And if cows don't strive in the system we've provided for them, they can go try it somewhere else. And it usually is at a &W or McDonald's. So we uh, strive to make our cows better. And the ones that are here gain weight and do well on the system we've provided. If the one thing we do is when we are moving every five days, if there is a cow develop, uh, we do have the odd one slip or something or hurt a hip in the winter time when we're grazing, since we're moving every five days, we make the cows go through uh, about a 50 foot spot in the fence that we pull back for them to move into the next paddock. So we make them all walk, you know, four or five wide through that hole. So if there is somebody that's not getting around very well or um, needs more attention, we can put that wire back up and walk her up to the, to the water area and catch her and put her in with the other group or take her up to help her. So we do train them to go through a 50 foot spot every, every time, just so we can manage them if we have to. Oh, uh, no, I, we already touched on it. Uh, whether it's a slough or natural bush uh, where I swath grazed this year, they actually came into the yard for water. So there was windbreaks in the pens. Um, you just, yeah, no, um, no, uh, we haven't had any issues as far as sickness. They need to get out of the wind somewhere you can't just have them on a bald open prairie with nowhere to stand uh you'd have issues and then kyle touched on it i mean it's just uh cows you, you whatever it is on your farm you make a set of rules to follow as far as what a cow has to achieve in a year the ones that achieve stay so their offspring stay and the ones that don't that, that you know and after you do it long enough you're left with a bunch of cows that fit the system yeah and it's funny you mentioned kyle like I, this year we had a couple of cows that were limping one day and uh, I had to, they were limping. We made note of it. Um, and then by the time we got up there the next day, they were both fine. I think it was a slip, like a sprain or whatever. They just must've fallen on something. So that is, that is something I've seen, but it hasn't been a big issue at all. No. Rob? No, I, it's usually it isn't. I mean, as long as we, there's always bush around and I guess <clears throat> we, Last year we had a little trouble. We didn't actually, the price of cull cows was so poor in the fall that we didn't cull anything. And we just were thought we had lots of feed and we'll just feed through it. So we had a couple that were cows that were over 14 that, you know, one had a hip go on her and we had to put her down. But that's a very rare thing. Like, I mean, it's, and there, you know, you'll see the odd one limping in, in a day, it's usually gone. And then if it isn't, you can address it then. But I mean, if, I don't think it would matter you could have these cows in a barn and I think you're, I honestly think you're more likely to pick up a pneumonia if they're in a barn in a pole shed than if they're out standing out in the trees huddled up for the most part. Well, and I, I got a real world example. Uh, I got married this summer. Hey, honey, love you. Not complaining. Uh, but I had a wedding to plan. So which meant I had bales to pick before August 13th. So we put up a bunch of hay at home, bale graze 600 bales at home where we've got a shelter belt and that's it. And I got sick and tired of seeing 250 cows jammed like sardines uh, in a tight little area where they could get out of the wind. We moved them back to their uh, uh, kind of winter grazing where there's a valley and those cows are spread out. They're, they're not crowded. Uh, you can hear the wind blowing above, but you can't see it. And I mean, those cows are... I feel I felt bad for them every day that they had to stand behind that bush because I knew there were other spots where I could better protect them. And that was a, that was a management fuck up big time and just give, give them food, water, and shelter, and they're going to stay healthy. They're they're It's just, it's usually it's us that's creating the issues uh, in my experience anyway. So guys, I got one more question. Um, I'm going to just quickly give away. So Rod, no pick. You're going to get the jacket. That was a great question. Uh, put your uh, information in the chat, please. And uh, Roger Mangin, you're getting the hat. Good question on uh, rotation. But uh, final question for you guys is, any of your final thoughts? Um, I, I guess, like, 
anything you would suggest to somebody that wants to try swath grazing, how you'd go about it. And then from a personal standpoint, your own farm, where do you see your swath grazing program going in the future? Uh, so Rob, we'll start with you, Owen, and then Kyle, if you want to finish this up. Or get the tough one. <clears throat> um, don't have any time to think. I'm going to sound like an idiot. Um, well, then, okay, give give the the number one so, advice you would give you would give to somebody first, and then you can uh, you can think while you're talking as far as what changes you're going to make. For sure. No, if I mean just uh, start small, fail small, learn big. I guess is is a saying that an American friend of mine laid on me, and I really appreciate that. Uh, just try it if it like. You know, no one understands yourself. Like Bud Williams said, is something that is sticks with has stuck with me since I took his the marketing course. Uh, you know, if you're not going to move fence every four or five days, you either have to accept what they're going to do, but accept more waste, or or just maybe this isn't the right fit for you, right? Maybe it's doing a bale graze or something different. Uh, you know, it's, you're going to have to tailor, you just have to be prepared to experiment and, and uh, try it on a, a smaller acreage or, or, you know, uh, talk to people that have been doing it for a long time and, and see what they would, other things, the tips that they were in your area that could maybe help you with that. Uh, and as far as on our operation, it'll be a, a first cut silage, second with a, with a, with a, swath grazing mix to follow uh you know it, it won't be in, it won't be in 23 i'm going to plant some corn because i'm just afraid that if i chop silage yet we'll get excited and think we need to meter it out again because it's such good feed and and uh try to eliminate eliminate that temptation but just stacking that that double crop option there is is I call it instead of not necessarily a pre-seed burn off with the chemical, I got a pre-seed pre grazing window in all my spreadsheets that I'm trying to capture and then spray and seed, but or cut and cut and seed or different things there. But yeah, that's probably best advice I could give. Cool. Oh, I should have talked to Robert two two years ago because I've been failing large and learning small. So I gotta I gotta yeah. change that around. You're in good um, no, I, I think it, yeah. <laughs> start small. Everybody seems to have a like a 20 acre or 30 acre field somewhere where it kind of is an easy fit to start with. You know, a little piece by the yard. It just seems I talked to a lot of producers and everyone's like, Oh, I got this one field where I'd like to try that. So I think most people have a place where it's a real easy fit to start with and then yeah, just get comfortable with it. Um, and then as far as, as far as on our own farm, it has worked so well here the last two years. If I knew it would never snow, I would sow everything down to a warm season blend on June 15th and I would quit making bales. Um, that's how much I like it. I can't commit to that because snow and other things I, I'm going to, but I'm, I will, I'm doing another 30 acres more than I did this year, next year. And I plan to make it a, a big part of the farm going forward. I mean, it's just, I've, I've loved bale grazing for years. I still have to make that bale or buy that bale and set that bale out and take the wrap off, which is still cheaper than feeding it every day. But all I got to do is swath if I'm going to swath graze. It is just, man, if you get cows that can do it and do well on it, I, uh, I think it's, the, it's a big part of our farm's future going forward for sure. Yeah. And I mean, ask questions. I mean, there is really no such thing as a stupid question. And you've just listen to four of us talk about it and you can watch this webinar. You can, you know, I mean, just ask questions and that's how you learn, right? Take advantage of someone else's mistakes for sure. No. Yeah. I think Owen's last comment is probably the biggest one. Somebody else has screwed it up. You might as well learn from them. Um, one thing that we've been trying to do over the last few years, extend our swath grazing. We used to swath graze for the month of December now we're going to swath graze till the 10th of February. Just extend that out as far as we can, get as many days before Mother Nature tells us we probably shouldn't do it. Um, and I would like like hearing what Rob said about just uh, being able to take one crop off and then put a swath grazing crop back in to utilize those acres a little better. Um, one, a few pointers that I would give just as a as a you know quick learning. Use good fencers, use good fence, 
and train your cows to electric fence before you start swap grazing because you don't need to try and figure out how to do all that while it's 30 below and there's a foot of snow. Because if your cows don't respect fence, you're going to hate swath grazing by Christmas time and never want to do it again. And I guess the one thing that I would close on is the reason we started swath grazing was to make our winter choring fit our lifestyle. Um, now, a thousand cows to us is not something that's scary because we'll just better suit our grazing system to handle that. I still make every hockey game Saturday and Sunday. And I used to resent my cows because the time it took me to feed them. Now I don't, and my kids hopefully won't. So if you resent your cows, your kids aren't going to want them either. So try and make a system that everybody enjoys or else they're not going to carry on. Well said. Hey Amen. That, yeah, oh, that's, that's good. Uh, I'm going to, I, I was going to give you the final word, Kyle, but damn it, that inspired me. This is a pen and there was a budget uh, that I posted first up. I mean, just do the math on this swath grazing. And like, especially when you talk about what, what Rob and Owen were talking about, about just capturing more sunlight with different plant species and then putting the right plant species in the middle of summer. There just isn't a ton of money to be made in commercial cattle production. The one thing we can control is our expenses. And this has the power. So yes, start slow, do what these guys said. What Kyle said about resenting your cows is the truest thing in the world. Of course, your kids are gonna hate the cows if a dad can't come to practice or we're late for hockey and he still shit on its boots. So it, you know, it stinks up the dressing room. I mean, that that is not a recipe for getting more people, uh, young people interested in farming. So uh, yeah, of course, start small, but I mean, there's a reason the four of us are on here tonight and, you know, hopefully we didn't come off as idiots is because this makes good sound financial sense. And I, I fucked it up two years in a row because uh, I uh, used a discipline instead of a swather, but there are some very easy answers and solutions to these problems. If you network and ask the damn questions. Um, so yeah, man, you guys, what a great webinar. Uh, awesome interaction. Uh, I, I'm going to thank everyone for coming on. Hopefully you learned something. We're going to post this. Um, but Rob, Kyle, oh, great job. And uh, thanks a million, you guys. I'll shoot you a message here after, but thanks a lot for being on. Awesome webinar. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Catch you later, guys.